It's been a real pleasure working with Dr. Williams. He's just a bastion of knowledge and expertise, and he's so willing to um, engage with folks and, and share that expertise and knowledge. Um, it's a real p pleasure and pr privilege for Dusty and I, and I'll allow him to introduce himself a little bit better um, here in a moment. But um, as Dr. Williams mentioned, uh, my name is Marshall Johnson. Um, I serve as the Executive Director for Audubon Dakota. Um, our program services North and South Dakota. We have some properties in North Dakota that we partner with uh, local ranchers and landowners to run cattle on. And I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit more um, here later. Um, but essentially, kind of some takeaways that we want to have for the quick presentation um, is to communicate a little bit about Audubon's wingspan, Audubon's history, the work that we've done over the past more than 100 years um, here in the Americas, um, as well as uh, an overview of the state of the uh, Great Plains grassland ecosystem. Um, obviously, we're a little bit out of, outside of that, that, but a lot of the threats, the challenges that we're facing in the Great Plains and the Central and Mississippi River flyways relative to grasslands, you're facing here, they're facing out west. Um, the challenges are, are pretty, that are unique to the grassland ecosystem are far and wide and, and widespread. And most importantly, we wanna um, give you a, a framework, a overview of the conserv Audubon's conservation ranching program. And this is by no means a finished product. We continue to revamp this product. We continue to um, try to make it as um, responsive on the ground as possible to local producers. Um, as you know, uh, one size fits all programs usually don't work for anyone. And so we're, it's uh, Audubon's uh, leading the charge around this, this program, but uh, we wanna make it as locally responsible and responsive as possible. And last, just kind of give you an overview of uh, progress to date. And if Dusty and I don't get too long-winded, we'll have time for a couple of uh, questions and answers. Um, before I get going, the most important aspect of this program has been our partnerships and our collaborations. Um, this is not a program that Audubon's, you know, come down out of our birdhouse and uh, we would a magic wand and we've got a program that's going to work for everyone. Um, we've benefited greatly from the expertise of individuals like uh, Dr. Williams, so many uh, hundreds really uh, ranchers and private landowners across the seven state geography that we have been building this pilot program. And so um, I just wanna put, I could put probably 20 or 30 more logos and, and hundreds of more names up there, but um, this just kind of underscores uh, some of our partnerships that we've um, pulled together um, to get this program off the ground. Now, uh, as I dive in here, this, this next slide, slide, I'm gonna ask that you don't throw anything at me. But there's a point to it, but uh, it would probably conjure up you know, the big bad wolf there. You can relax a little red riding hood. The new federal dietary guidelines uh, say granny can't eat you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can, we can laugh at that now. I, I remember, to be honest with you, before uh, one evening, afternoon evening in uh, Bowman, North Dakota, southwest North Dakota, when I was meeting with a rancher, and this was a couple days after those proposed guidelines came out, um, I never even knew that uh, the federal dietary guidelines existed and how much they drove um, what, we, what we ate uh, growing up in school and you know, per the purchasing power um, and purchasing guidelines of local school districts. Um, th there's a lot of funding um, and a lot of decisions that get made based on these guidelines. And so um, it was really, what I learned was it was scary to have these guidelines for the first time um, uh, really uh, uh, recommend that uh, red meat and good clean, uh, lean red meat were not uh, to be a part of the American diet. And that's really, we can have the cute cartoons, but that's a real concern and it's really no laughing matter. Um, and why is it important? You're probably asking why is that important to Audubon? Um, it's centrally important to Audubon. We're stewards of grassland birds across this geography and uh, the day that there are no more cattle ranchers and, gra and cattle's not being produced on grass is the day that we no longer have the full suite, suite of grassland bird species. Um, our fate is inextricably linked together and we recognize that as an organization and that's really the impetus behind this program is how can we 
utilize the very well-known Audubon brand injected into the marketplace in a way that grows consumer demand by communicating uh, the conserv grassland conservation attributes associated with grass-fed beef, grass-fed and pasture-raised beef. And we feel like it's time that conservation steps up and supports the industry um, because we, our fate is so inextricably uh, linked together. A couple of takeaways from our, you know, our uh, public comment. This was the first time that Audubon had ever commented publicly on the uh, federal uh, dietary guidelines. But there was two main things I want to take from it. it you can, it's a public comment, so you can go research that. But there's two main things that we wanted to convey to the uh, uh, dietary uh, guidelines uh, committee. And number one was the value of properly managed livestock grazing that maintains functional grasslands that continue to pro provide wildlife habitat um, and a host of ecosystem services such as improved water quality and reduced soil erosion. We could throw the, uh, ex a carbon sequestration up there as well. There's a body and wealth of evidence that shows what properly managed grasslands can do for carbon sequestration. That's a big topic out there and people really need to know that. Um, and the second, probably the most important part um, that we wanted to communicate to that Dietary Guidelines Committee was the importance of private landowners and their stewardship of private and public lands uh, to the future of bird and wildlife populations in America. You know, that's Audubon's position. And this is, while it seems a little uh, novel for Audubon to be weighing in so deeply in this, it's really the fabric of who we are as an organization, who we've always been. Uh, we're the voice of birds. And uh, where, where birds take us and uh, the challenges that birds take us to address, um, we, we have to listen to, to them because that's, that's our mission. Um, birds are really the um, canary in the coal mine, if you will. And right now in the Northern Great Plains, um, and just to kind of underscore again our network, um, through our various channels, we, we reach directly roughly four million people. And we're talking about building a product and putting the Audubon logo or some um, form of the Audubon logo on a product. Um, that's really important. We can reach four million consumers uh, nationwide and many millions more people. We have just under a million uh, members nationwide spread across 467 local chapters, local communities in all 50 states. Um, through our nature centers, we have 46 of them. We reach over a million people uh, in the urban areas, and again, very important. These are areas where, um, unfortunately, uh, beef can be a four-letter word in the worst context. That's not good for our, mutually, um, our mutual goals. And through our centers, through our network, we want to tell a different um, story around beef and um, the ecological services that properly um, uh, produce beef uh, can make. This is our network here in the Central Flyway. We have six state programs, um, uh, probably a hundred or so staff in the Central Flyway. Again, across that grassland uh, uh, landscape. And again, back to that notion of birds being ecological indicators, kind of the canaries in the coal mine. Um, if, if they are that, and we think that they are, their silence right now on the, the northern Great Plains is deafening. It's a bullhorn. Um, it's sounding an alarm to, to really what's, what we see on the charts with the science, what the everyday you know, antidote will tell you. Birds are disappearing. Grassland birds are disappearing. And you can kind of get a sense of the challenges that uh, the ecosystem um, and the birds that are supported and obligate to this ecosystem are facing. Um, over the last hundred years, we've lost a hundred million acres of grasslands in this landscape. In the, in the last ten years alone, we've lost 23 million acres of grassland the size of Indiana. In that same time, uh, roughly 7.4 million acres of grasslands have been impacted by energy development. And that's roughly the size of Delaware and Maryland uh, put together. Just in Oklahoma alone, eastern cedar forest encroachment has overtaken roughly 11.6 million acres, one state, one state's grasslands. That's roughly the size of Vermont and Rhode Island 
uh, together. And you can see as the out outcropping of urban areas continue, that's encroaching on grassland habitat as well. So the, the reasons behind Audubon and conservation groups being involved in preserving our grasslands are, are pretty straightforward. It's just a map that kind of shows that in detail in my neck of the woods, the prairie pothole region. You can kind of see over time how the grasslands disappear from the landscape. Show that again. And these four pictures for me, and I'll turn it over to Dusty, uh, these four pictures are, would give me the most optimism. Um, the lower left-hand corner there, that's our Frederick L. Wicks Prairie in Northwest uh, North Dakota when I saw it for the first time three years ago when I became state director. And uh, as you can see, you know, no grassland bird would sully itself to nest in that. It hadn't been burned or grazed for 20 odd years. And uh, we didn't have, you know, caught, uh, fire, uh, prescribed burn can be cost prohibitive. Um, it really wasn't an option. And it probably wasn't the best option. You know, that could be good forage. And we found uh, Todd and, well, Todd and Cindy uh, Brown found us. And um, over the last three years, Todd has used his cattle in an amazing way. You know, I, uh, some of this stuff for a biologist could be self-evident. I studied business. I didn't study biology, biology in college. So I saw it and learned it firsthand watching Todd Brown utilize his cattle to really restore um, those that, our grasslands uh, here in the last three years. And we often talk, he and I often talk about our partnership being a little unique. Um, you know, when we were cranking out a, a grazing plan for our sanctuary, um, I told them, you know, get those, you can get those uh, stocking rates as high as you want because I know how you want to manage grassland. You want to get those cattle in there, you want to keep them moving. And he was kind of shocked because he kind of, we were a wildlife conservation group, he just assumed that, you know, we would want, you know, 20 cattle out in a 1,500 acre um, paddock and, and we would get the results that we wanted. Absolutely not. He knows better than I how to get those grasslands restored, and he's done an amazing job. And when we talk, um, we often talk about, uh, he will share that, you know, what he's in it for is to have the most abundant, highest quality, nutrient-dense um, uh, forage available to his cattle. Um, he loves the wildlife, but that's not what he's in it for. And when we talk, um, I think the perspective of conservation for many years has been, uh, grassland conservation has been, we don't care about the cattle, we don't care about the market, we just want the benefits on the landscape. And over the years we've come to think, I think both of us, there's a deeper, more impactful story to be told here. There's a deeper, more impactful partnership to be had between conservation and particularly the grass-fed and pasture-raised beef markets. There's a story to be told in our big demand centers in California and New York that don't quite understand the benefits that grass-fed producers and pasture-raised uh, cattle producers are providing to the landscape. And uh, my colleague here, here, Dusty, can kind of dive into how we've worked on this project. But the thing that I would communicate most about this is, um, or leave you with, is you know, this is not Audubon's program alone. You know, our partners have helped us build, the, build this program from scratch, um, and it's been the local private landowners that have guided this program more than anyone. I'm myself a fourth generation rancher, um, and I, I remember as a kid, you know, dad taking us out and, and saddling up the horses with my sister and my brother and, and uh, going out to go check the cows. And, and we did it pretty often, you know, we'd go out and we'd ride through the cows and the calves, and. We'd go see how many damn fences the yearlings broke through this week and, and uh, you know, but it wasn't just about us going through there and checking the cows. I remember dad, you know, pointing out uh, mule deer scat next to a frozen pond. I remember him talking about the hawks and the raptors that were flying up over top of us. Um, and I remember him actually grabbing handfuls of dirt and, and smelling them, just like many of you did yesterday when we were on our tour. How many of you grabbed a handful of that compost and just, just smelled it and just felt it, felt it go through your hands? Well, Dad did that, and that, that taught something to me. Now, that being said, there were probably times that he was just wiping the Copenhagen off his hand, um, or, you know, he, he wasn't necessarily somebody who could identify the difference between a, a goose and a sandhill crane, but... 
he definitely instilled something in me. And that's why I think this project is such an important project and why I'm here now, why Marshall's here, why we are really trying hard to make that connection with, with landowners. So as Marshall said, why, why Audubon? Audubon of all groups. And, and the answer is, again, Audubon understands that without that private land, there's not going to be those birds. There's not going to be that wildlife. That is our final commitment here, is that we are, are ready to throw our hat in the ring and really, really jump out there and, and do what we can for ranchers like yourselves, and especially the ranchers that are doing the, the amazing work that you all right here are already doing, right? So as opposed to coming up with other things, we want to reward those folks that are already doing such great, amazing work. And as Marshall said, we have to change the conversation, right? There are always going to be those people out there in the world that think when a, when a cow lifts her tail and poops on the ground that a cloud flies out of the sky and kills an angel, right? But the fact of the matter is, we need to change that conversation. There are so many benefits, right? Now, you've been hearing over the past couple of days about all of the benefits that have to do with the market and, and the benefits that have to do with the consumer. But what we're here to talk about is really the benefits to the birds and the wildlife. We want to bring that to the forefront with this group and let you know that we understand that what you're doing has those huge benefits to that wildlife to that legacy that we're going to leave on you know the land for the rest of our kids and the fact of the matter is as marshall said the birds are going down they're declining and not all of them right but the, but they are declining and so we feel like as audubon it's our responsibility to come in there and say all right we need to throw our hat in the ring and we need to stick up for the folks that are really providing the habitat Right? They're providing the places for those birds to land and the, and the migration routes and, and the grassland that those birds really need. Okay? So how can we make a difference? Marshall went into this just a little bit. Okay? We feel like we can leverage our Audubon brand in a, in a pretty unprecedented way. Right? We've got that network of people that right now, if we say this product is what you should be buying because it's good for the birds, these folks will jump at it, right? We feel like there are a whole scheme of people out there that are ready for this, that they can sit down and have a conversation as they eat dinner with their friends and their family and talk about why they get that warm, fuzzy feeling eating this good grass-fed beef, okay? So it's just another aspect. It's just another option for, for us as producers to really get that name out there and, and, and really be proud of a product that we have. Right? We've created a pretty decent network. All right? We've got producers, as Marshall said, all across the region. We've got experts like Dr. Williams. We've got mines. There's folks in this, this, this room right now, Warren over here, who actually are kind of the brainchilds on this. All right? There are some pretty fabulous mines that have put this together, and now it's time for Audubon to come in and really start to, to bring forward that certification and really start to, to move forward with it. So, um, yeah. We know that we can, we, can, we can put that brand out there, and it has a powerful impact. It has a powerful impact. So again, there are experts at this, at this room right now that have talked to everybody about the benefits, both to us as producers, also to the consumers and the retailers, but what I really want to highlight is that benefit to the wildlife, right? That's another real key reason that a lot of us want private land and that we enjoy that private land. It isn't just what we make off the cows, but it's also all those other aesthetic things that, that go along with that as well, like the wildlife. All right. Nope. There we go. All right, so where are we at? Where is Audubon at? Well, we have developed protocols. We have developed protocols, but we've developed protocols with producers that we feel like really set producers up for success. There's nothing extraordinary here, okay? It's stuff that pretty much everybody in this room, I can almost guarantee you, is already doing, all right? Um, but we have to have those protocols. And if those protocols are, are, are followed, we feel like we can very comfortably put our brand on a product and help the, the producers make a little bit more money. Okay? Now, it's just an option. 
If you don't like it, you don't have to be part of it. If you don't fall into those protocols, you don't have to be part of it, right? But it's just one more option for us as producers to be able to actually get out there and make a little bit more through the market, all right? We've got a really, really good group of people that have developed those protocols. We have got the marketing piece of it, all right? And, and we're ready to really start jumping into the supply chain. We're ready to start really plugging producers in and get this pro program moving. All right. You want to do this one? So um, over, as we mentioned, we've been working on the program for probably three and a half, four years. Uh, probably when you talk to folks like Max Allegra out of Missouri, who's been a key collaborator in the project. Um, a lot of the work's been going on a lot longer than that. Um, it, it's fairly self, uh, uh, it's fairly intuitive that uh, if you produce cattle in such a way that you have more abundant forage um, through um, a holistic management or rotational grazing system, you're going to have more wildlife, but we have to prove that. When we say that in the marketplace, we have to be able to prove that. Um, and so over the last three years, we've invested nearly two million, just over two million dollars into the development of, of this program. Um, we completed a feasibility study that was done by the Wellspring Group um, here in 2012, 2013, and their recommendations were fairly clear um, that by utilizing the Audubon brand, a major conservation brand um, as such, um, we can provide an additional premium in the marketplace for the producer. And that's really the brass tacks of this whole program. If we can't produce a premium for prospective and enrollees in this program, then the program has no, has no um, legs. And, and so we try to really focus on the market. Um, yes, we're going to focus and we're going to have a certification program for the production, but we have to, we have to deliver for you or for whoever is a, pr a prospective uh, producer in the marketplace. Um, and so we completed the feasibility studies and we've acted on those recommendations. We've organized workshops and listening sessions throughout the geography. I believe just uh, last week or two weeks ago, um, we have had a listening session in uh, Douglas, Wyoming, and Dr. Williams was there and, and helped uh, uh, guide that uh, workshop for roughly 20 or 30 producers, 40, 40 producers, excuse me. Um, and we've continued to develop the best strategy that we can possibly have um, for the Audubon brand to be in the marketplace and drive consumer demand for this bird-friendly beef product. Um, development of science-based, bird-friendly, I must be going too long because <laughs> we're, we're getting some complaints, right? Uh, so development of science-based, bird-friendly, uh, grazing protocols with input from out, outside experts. Um, our uh, par chief partner in that um, has been the uh, Animal Welfare Approved. They've really helped us on the ground develop those protocols. But again, at every step of the way, there's been private producers and landowners in the room helping us develop those protocols um, because they have to be workable. If they're not workable, they could be the greatest things in sliced bread and it will go nowhere. And again, this kind of gives you, you know, the uh, standards and the habitat and grazing standards are for us the key to the program, being able to communicate the benefits to the consumer and back that up. And this is our pilot geography the, for the program. We hope to, um, this program will be reviewed by our national board here in about three weeks. And we hope to move forward with a pilot in seven uh, different states and across the Midwest and then build out from there. There are a lot of things, that, as I stressed in the beginning, there's a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, we've tried to be as thoughtful as possible and we've tried to bring in some really good minds into this, but there are a lot of things that we don't know and we're gonna learn over time. Again, just to underscore uh, the importance of partnerships to developing this program, it is a different look at doing conservation. It's a different perspective, but we believe in this product in a way that, that has made it um, uh, reasonable and, and made it worthwhile investing the time, resources, and effort we have into developing this program. But again, it comes down to the bottom line. Um, Audubon is committed to working collaboratively with ranchers and private landowners throughout the Great Plains and abroad um, in order to conserve grassland birds at scale through this market-based strategy.